Pauline Sarah Jo Moyes, known professionally as Jojo Moyes, is an English journalist and an award-winning romance novelist, number one, number one New Times, New York Times best-selling author and also screenwriter. She's one of only a few authors to have twice won the Romantic Novel of the Year Award by the Romantic Novelist Association, and her works have been translated into dozens of languages and have sold over 50 million copies worldwide. Wow. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much for having me. I'm so thrilled. I'm a huge fan for a long time now. So wow. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for having me. So I know you have three coffees in the morning and the third goes with breakfast, which <laughs> usually <laughs> is an omelette with tomato and goat cheese and asparagus. Um, not anymore. Oh, you not changed anymore. it. Because <laughs> uh, my whole life has changed since that routine. Okay. And so now, like this morning, I went to see my horse very early in the morning. I now live in London. And so I drive out to the countryside where he, he lives. And so my uh, breakfast is a protein bar in the car on the way back with a flask of coffee. So I still have coffee number three, but it tends to be while I'm driving. <laughs> and how, how do you tend to your, how does it do to your temper? You eat, you eat less. <laughs> uh, maybe, yeah, probably less healthily, though. Yeah, <laughs> it's just uh, eating on the go, like so many people. <laughs> and you tend to be insomniac, and your addiction, is is it still Scrabble? Yes, uh, I'm better at sleeping now. Oh, great. That's uh, great I've, I've, I think there's been a few life changes, and maybe it changed my metabolism or my mental setup but uh, I used to average three to four sometimes five hours a night and now uh, I'm kind of six or seven which is a big improvement um, yeah of course of course so I, I was I, I told before I'm going to say to my listeners as well I ordered your online course on writing love stories at BBC Master <laughs> Yes, it was actually right. a few days previously the black the Black Friday discount. So I was like, oh, okay, but it's okay. It's, it's oh no, it. <laughs> it was worth it anyway. Well, I'm I look so forward thrilled. to reading your novel. Well, I hope so. Fingers crossed. <laughs> so about your books, which I loved all. I suppose I'm not the first to tell you this, but I would very much like to be Luke Clark's friend. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, I like, I mean, I miss Lou Clark as well. After writing three books and one short story about her, she felt like my friend too. And yeah. it's really lovely when you develop a character like that because you know everything that they would do. So it becomes like meeting up with an old friend. You you don't have to kind of consider, would this be true? Would that be true of, of what they would do? Because I know her. I know her inside out. I know her weaknesses, her strengths, her kindnesses, her goofy humor. Um, yeah, I think she would be a good person to be friends with. She'd certainly yeah. look out for you. Yeah, and she's and she's honest and genuine and kind. Yeah, and also funny. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite nice to write a book about a genuinely good person. Um, uh, yes, I'm showing to uh, <laughs> played by the amazing um Amelia Clark, uh, who I who I now picture when I picture Lou because she inhabited her so fully. Yeah, it's true. I think well, I'm, I'm going to sh show your books to the to the audience, and yeah, Amelia Clark, uh, she was Lou Clark's uh actor. The, the casting, great casting. I also, yeah. and now I can't read her without imagining the, the actress. <laughs> yes. So we have the Me Before You, for those who haven't read or only saw the movie, Me Before You, Emily Clark and Sam Claflin. He's very handsome, Sam Claflin. Very handsome. <laughs> and then we have After You, which is translated into Portuguese, Viver Sem Ti. I'm showing you the Portuguese covers as well. And yeah. then I love this one also. Still Me, which in Portuguese is another title, and it's called O Meu Coração Entre Dois Mundos. It's like My Heart Between Two Worlds. Yes. Which makes There's sense. There's a phrase in the book which sort of references that, so that's a good title for it. And then I recommend all of them. And then you have the last one in, in Portugal, translated, Someone Else's Shoes. I'm going <laughs> to... I brought them all. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm showing the Portuguese cover. You know, when I heard, when I knew that I was going to interview you, I was so thrilled. And I got up at my office 
it's a large room, an open space. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going to interview Jojo Moyes. And some of them <laughs> were like, oh, that's great. Who is she? So <laughs> yeah, I'm exactly. committed. I'm committed <laughs> to the Portuguese audience. <laughs> Thank you so books. much. <laughs> and also one plus one. Uh, that's I one of my it. favorites. It's it's also mine. I love yeah. jazz. I love jazz. And add um my zoom. So you have a lot of them and more even people can search online, uh, more that aren't translated yet into Portugal, Paris for one, which is short stories. But so I recommend all your work and in someone else's shoes, we have two women, 45, 47, Nisha and Cantor. They literally exchange, well, they don't exchange, one loses the shoes and, Nisha, yeah. and the other gets them. So people can check all that online. And I'm a, a special fan I think I haven't shown you yet. A Mensageiros da Esperança, the giver of stars. I also loved it. Alice. Thank you. That's my favorite of all my books. Wow. Actually. That one came out of me in a kind of rush. Like everything that I cared about came out in that book. And it's so great. It, it's quite different from the others, but I, I loved living in Kentucky. I loved doing the things that the women did um and absorbing the language and nature and and just writing about female solidarity you know i think women in fiction are often pitted against each other and that's not my experience in my experience women tend to support and lift each other up so that's what i wanted to reflect just strong capable women helping each other and that's great and their love for books which is also great and we, love for books. we have a yeah. book about books as well yes <laughs> Yes, I'm so thrilled you loved it. It's, it's my, it's the one. The first I recommend is this one, The Giver of Stars. Oh, thank you. It thank is, you. it is. I love Alice and her friends, of course. I've read it a long time now, but yeah, I still remember a few parts. Great. <laughs> so, um, let me see this one. And you, you, um, The Giver of Stars was a Reese Witherspoon book club choice, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Um, yeah, she's become an immensely powerful force in in books in America. And so it was absolutely thrilling that she liked this one. Uh, it just it gives everything just a boost. It's so hard to get any book into kind of public view at the moment because there's so many books competing and people's phones and cinema and TV yeah. obviously draw the attention. So it was really lovely to have that. That's great. So I also read uh, um, that you, when you, I, I read, I listened to an interview of yours and you said when you are writing that you prefer to read short stories or newspapers. Yeah, I find and it very difficult to absorb other people's stories while I'm writing. I don't want to, I want to keep my vision really clear. Yeah, not to what, get inspired or uh, yeah. by other, yeah. So and then you said that you avoid reading other books, but then when you finish your book, you need some distance and it started with a month and now it's three to four months before getting back to it. Ideally, yeah, because I think if you really don't look at it and you have to not look at it, when you come back to it, you see the weaknesses, you see the faults, you see the holes, you see the things that might not quite make sense. And when you're deep into writing, especially towards the end of writing a book, you're so consumed by it. You're, you're in the forest, you know, you can't see beyond the trees. And so you need that distance to step outside and go, oh, okay, that needs to be pulled together with that or that needs to go. Um, I think, you know, the real skill in writing is not writing the story. It's in what you do to it afterwards. It's the, the editing, the honing, the tweaking, the polishing. Those are the things that to me separate a writer from a good writer. Okay, and do you have a better reader? Do you show to someone? Uh, it varies. I, I'm not very good at showing my work until it's finished because I find you're really vulnerable for a period, especially up to about 30,000 words. If I showed it to somebody then and they said, oh, I'm not sure I like that, I would lose all confidence. I would okay. think this isn't working. And sometimes you need to just understand that that's the process. And I know now that, you know, I think I've written coming up to 20 books, 17 yeah. of them wow. for publication. And what I know is that I will always have a mental wobble at about 30,000 words. I, I will never be quite sure that I'm going to carry on with that book up to that point. 
And then beyond that, there's going to come a point where I tie myself in a knot and I can't work out how to unpick the plot. Or, And so I've got used to the fact that there are frustrating stages in the writing process and I need to trust myself. And so if I give that over to somebody else too early, I might lose my own confidence in what I'm doing. Wow, even after almost 20 books. Yeah, yeah, it never gets easier. I always say it's like having children. You know, you do it once and then you have another one and you go, how on earth did I do that before? <laughs> That's true. And they're all yeah. they're all different, same as your books. They're all different. <laughs> okay, so now let's get to know you as a reader. You know, this podcast also shows okay. our favorite writers and people as a reader. So the books you chose, actually, it was a great coincidence. Where is it? Oh. I'm trying to find it. It's the um, Small Things Like This by Claire yeah. Keegan. Yeah. So tell me about has it. Has it been translated in Portugal? It has. It has. Pequenas coisas como estas. Okay. It's, it's literal it's translation. It's such a beautifully written book. I mean, it's very short, which I think some people need at the moment, especially people who've got out of the habit of reading. Um, but there is not a wasted word in it. She has a poet's soul. You know, everything is beautifully observed, beautifully crafted. And it it slightly breaks your heart, this little story, and then puts it back together again. And it's based on a true thing that happened in Ireland to do with uh, religion and, and young children and women who were unmarried. And it was a, a big scandal in the UK and an island. So uh, she's made a little story about a good man who starts to work out that something is wrong in his small town. And I don't want to say any more, but it's, he has five it's daughters. lovely to read a book about a, just a good middle-aged man as well. You don't read many of those. So, uh, but most of the beauty of that book is in the writing. It's so skillful. And I think it takes her about eight years to write a book. Wow. And they're very short. They're like 20,000 words, which is about uh, one sixth of a length of my books. But I think she's a genius. Yeah, it's great. It's around 110 pages of a, a book uh, pocket edition. It's mm. small. I don't have the Portuguese with me, but I'm showing to the who's, who's ever watching the small small things like this. I loved it. I think it's in word, word in one word. It's tender. Yes, that's exactly what it is. It's very tender and forensically observed, like everything takes on significance, the way somebody picks up or puts down a teacup or the way somebody says hello. You know, you start to see those tiny clues in in the environment around you. And I loved that. I loved her observation. Yeah, and, and the way he thinks about life, Bill Furlong is the, the leading character, father yeah. of five daughters, and it's the only thing I, I, it seems it's ancient. It's it's not ancient, yes. it's older, the time where they live it. Yes, it? yes. Because he sells um, coal for the, and wood for the fireplaces and it, it goes on in winter. Yes. But so, I can just about remember the tail end of that way of living, which was very small and very gray, especially yeah. in our part of the world. Exactly. But that very kind of eked out existence so yeah it, it I guess it hit home for me yeah great also recommend it Pequenas coisas como estas. the next book you chose no aliás, before that Clara Keegan the author she's an Irish writer she's known for sh her short stories she's raised on a farm in Wicklow and she became the first in her family to go to university when as a teenager in the 80s she she said this she was tired of being a second class citizen on account of her gender. So she left to study politics in New Orleans and there she ended up studying literature. I didn't know that. I yeah. didn't know that. That's fascinating. It is. And this book also, she it was shortlisted for the um, Booker Prize in 2022. Yeah. So now the next book you chose, we also have it translated, which was great. And I have it beneath my computer and when I get it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lessons of Chemistry by Bonnie Garmas. I also yeah. loved it and I gave it to my mother and everybody loves it. Everybody loves this book. I gave it to my father who is 80 
And he's a keen rower still, even though he's 80. And he loved it. And he even went to see her speak because he liked it so much. And I think it's there's this combination of uh, humor and, I don't know, satire, and but also just the outrageousness of what happened to women in the 1950s and 60s and what we were expected to put up with. But she somehow dolls it out with such wit and kind of compassion that you you never feel like you're being told oh you should feel bad this is a terrible situation and and she pulls off extraordinary feats like at one point there is a talking dog which would normally make me want to hurl a book across a room I'd be like oh come on this isn't Disney but actually it's done so cleverly that you barely notice that you're reading the words of a talking dog. <laughs> he just, what he does is sort of, he explains from his vision the thing that the main characters can't see for themselves. And yeah. it's lovely. But I, I I laughed, I cried a bit, I felt outraged, I was gripped. And I, it, I think last year or the year before, it was the book that I pushed on more people than in, you know than any other. Wow, it was great. I loved it also. And uh, other, unlike you, I and I never thought it was a Disney. I just loved the dog from the beginning. I was like, I want this dog. I want my dog to, to act like he, he was so clever. Yeah. And then the way they came up with his name, Six and a Half, you know, I didn't watch the series. I know it's in a series. And a friend of mine, she hasn't read the book. And I said, please read the book, even if you've yeah. watched the series. And the way they, the... The reason why he has that name in the series is different. And it was yes. so smart in the book. And it was so funny, so realistic. So please read the book, everyone. You know what? So I watched the again. series and Did you? I would just stick to the book. Yeah, great. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll have yeah. that in mind. Some Thank things you. are better just in book form. And I would yeah. say that one is one of them. of them. Yeah, most I, of them. I haven't, I think I've met one person so far out of hundreds who didn't love that book, actively love it. So uh, I would say it's a good, a good gift for people. Yeah, totally. I gave it to my mother, my father. And, and especially, you know, I love writing, I love reading. So chemistry wasn't, uh, uh, it yeah. wasn't catchy for me in yeah. even the book cover. So I was like, forget the chemistry. It's not about the chemical, it's, it's the chemical part yeah. it's about her. And she's also, she's at the same time, very intelligent. She's bright and naive at the same time. Yes. And she you know, really is. And I told you I'm a, I'm a writer wannabe, aged 44 already, but she wrote this book, Bonnie Garmas, aged 65. And it's her first book. Yes. <laughs> And look what happened. I mean, it's been a global success. Yeah, <laughs> it was great. So the Sonich de Kimika by Bonnie Garmas. Your next, the next book you chose is the first one that I don't know. I haven't read it yet. Oh Brother by John Niven. Okay, so this is a book which sounds, I'm going to make it sound quite gloomy, but it's, um, it's a, biographical book it's about John Niven's relationship with his brother and his family after and the sort of digging down he does into his family dynamics after his brother commits suicide and I know that sounds very sad and there are parts of this book that are incredibly sad but it's also told with so much wit and humor and wisdom about how we are within our families and the roles that we play and it's it's just a really clever and beautifully compassionate way of looking at how a life can just go off track and and how if you are the sibling how you can be blind to your siblings needs because there's a sort of competition for attention from the beginning and yet you know he tells stories about his childhood and his family in in Scotland which made me howl with laughter because there are characters that everybody recognizes, you know, the uncle who gets drunk and sings Frank Sinatra and, you know, sings my way as if he's been kind of blazing a trail across the world instead of actually just visiting the same bar across the road for the last 30 years. You know, it's just, he has this magnificent ability to kind of just pull 
the threads of people apart a bit so that you look at them and you recognize them in your own family. And the thing that really marked this book out for me, though, is there is a final chapter, and I don't want to say too much, but it's where he very bravely puts himself in his brother's head at the end of his life, but kind of gives him a redemption. He kind of sends him on his way with a bit of writing that is so incandescently beautiful and unexpected. Um, I, it's like watching a movie screen with a million beautiful things coming towards you. And I, um, I was playing this recently, I'd read it in book form and then my partner was reading it, but listening to it on an audio. And I said, have you listened to the last chapter? And, and he said, no. And we we listened to it in a, in a car journey coming back from a, an event. And it was about an hour in the car. And by the end of it, both of us were sobbing. Like he was driving, oh. I was crying. Not because it was so sad, but because it was so beautiful. Oh. And it, he's an extraordinary writer, John Niven. He's written very kind of macho books before. Like um, there's a famous book about the, the music industry called kill your friends and it's yeah. all very kind of martin amos or it's a satire kind of, of the view, the music business yeah very tough very and this is a whole nother side of him which is tender and beautiful and compassionate and i loved it I, it's one of those books that even though it was a tough read in places i will read again and again because i also i'm envious because i I love the way he wrote it. You know, it's that thing when someone writes a really good paragraph and you just go, oh, I wish I'd written that. <laughs> so read it while you're writing <laughs> mm. to inspire you and like what you really? do. <laughs> so yeah, he wrote Kill Your Friends, which was a satire and uh, it was a huge success. And this one, he, his brother, Gary, took his own life at age 42. And you said that, mm. I thought it we were, would think about our friends and, you know, you know, a lot of people suffer in silence, which is the, yes. you know, depression. Especially is the men. Most, yeah, especially men. And so, yeah, but you also mentioned siblings and you're right. I have three boys and, and they're not, they're young. Well, I have a teenager already. The youngest is seven and the oldest is 17. And then there's a 12 year old and they're not uh, friends yet. You know, they're always yeah. uh, fighting. And, yeah. and so they don't have obviously the maturity to read this book, but I'll have that in mind. Like, listen to this, read this. And, yeah. Uh, and also, I mean, I think it might as be interesting as a parent to read yeah, it because yeah. it makes you think about, I mean, I have three children also, also and my yes, boys I... have become friends in the last three, four years. So there's hope uh, for me. <laughs> yeah, one is 22 and one is 18. So okay. I think there is definitely an age where they suddenly kind of see the point of each other. <laughs> um, but it does make you think about how you treat your kids and how you put them into roles without even realizing that we do it. And it's it's quite interesting that way. Yeah, because in this book, you see that. You see that the author in the beginning has a little maybe remorse because he was brought differently from his brother, but yeah. also because his brother was more difficult to, to upbring. Yeah. To. And also now when you look at his brother's behavior through some of the um, mental health adjustments we've made in recent years, I look at him and I think, I think you had ADHD. You know, I think yeah. you had attention deficit disorder and it's that thing where people get labeled as naughty or unable to concentrate when actually it's just because their brain needed a different way to be harnessed. And there's such a waste in that, like these lives that of previous generations where they got labeled as naughty or, you know, just yeah. bad boys, especially when actually they just needed a different kind of raising or a different kind of teaching. And I think... That's something that's really changed in the last three or four years, even. Thank God, yeah, it's better. Now. Yes, we have labels to put on things, and wait, they're not all sheep. <laughs> yes, yeah, we're exactly. just different. We're, we're just, just different. different. Do your kids read your books? Um, my daughter does. Uh, they didn't. I don't think either of them, any of them, really thought about what I did until Me Before You became a film, and I brought them <laughs> on set one day and. They met Amelia Clark and suddenly everyone was just like, oh, my God, mom is not just this person who sits in the spare room in her pajamas, you know, <laughs> grumpily writing. She has a proper job. Um, 
And so I think they loved that side of it. They love the kind of movie making part of it. Um, my daughter now works in publishing, so she uh-huh. has read more of my books, but she finds it difficult because she can hear my voice. Okay. It must be quite strange, you know, to read. It must be hard, hard to let go of the idea that that is your parent. And also, she's got really good at analysing manuscripts, so I don't know if I want her to read my stuff. <laughs> And then she also liked to, yeah, and with with honesty, with no filter. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And you know, she did a master's, and now her one of the main parts of her job is is editorializing manuscripts and working out how to make them better. And I don't know if I'm ready for that. (laughs) And then she also likes to write. Uh, She's thinking about it. I think she hasn't got the confidence yet, um, but she's definitely, I think what reading other people's manuscripts make makes you realise that there's no magic involved. You know, it's like this BBC Maestro course that I you, you mentioned at the beginning. It's not magic. It's It's doing it again and again and again and again until you work out what works for you. And, you know, it's like I said earlier, the writing is some of it, yes, but it's it's really about what you do once you've done that writing. Have I got the courage to just slice away a thousand words here and a thousand words there? Have I got the um, ability to see that one character isn't working and take them out and replace them with something else? You know, it's it's about making big decisions and and letting go of your ego to some extent. You have to say... Okay, it's not that great. But what's also interesting about it and what was interesting for me doing that course and unpicking how I did it, because I had no idea how I did it until I had to look at it, was that I don't get emotional about the process. And I think a lot of people who want to write have this idea of themselves as a writer. And so if it doesn't go well, they go, oh, that means I'm not a writer. Whereas my view is, this is my job. I'm going to get a thousand words done today. And it may well be that tomorrow I decide 900 of them are terrible, but I'm going to keep going because I understand that this is a process. It doesn't affect who I am. It's just about the work. So I try and not, you know, of course, I'm going to get grumpy sometimes if it's really not working or I'm going to get excited if something does work, but it doesn't affect my sense of self. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And what fascinated me talking to other people was how much some people get locked into this emotional relationship with their work so that when something isn't working, it feels like they're not working and then they can't go back to it because it's too emotional and it's too difficult. Um, I, to- I totally get you. <laughs> you do? Okay. I do. I, I do. No, down but- a rabbit hole. no, no, I'm, I'm taking that as an advice. So um, it says here that this this meeting will end in 10 minutes well we'll try to wrap up but um so uh thank you for that <laughs> do, do you write as you go along you have you know girl meets boy and you have your premise and from the beginning of course but do you when you say like from a thousand words you have to cut 900 do you do that yeah. on the day after or you, first you write the whole book in your mind and then you go edit it it, it varies day to day i have a rough idea of what I want to say in a book. So it's not even about the plot sometimes. I ask myself, what is this book really about? So me before you, for example, you could say, this is a book about a boy and a girl. You know, he wants to end his life. She decides to change his mind. They fall in love. Will they, won't they get what they want? You know, yeah. that's that's what you think the book's about. But actually... Underneath it, what that book is about is who decides what makes a life? Who yeah. decides, you know, what's worth going through just to stay alive? It's also like, what do you do if the thing that you love most or the person you love most in the world doesn't want to be there? How do you reconcile that? So, Yes, it's boy meets girl in an unusual set of circumstances, but there are bigger fundamental questions. And I think why that book succeeded and sold so many copies was because it forced the reader to ask themselves a question, which is, what would I do if the life I wanted to live was removed from me? How would I 
move forward? Would I be able to move forward? And it also asks the question, what would you do if the person that you loved most in the world didn't want to be here anymore? And, and in our world where most of us have had relatives who've required care or, you know, people who've been in unbearable circumstances, we ask ourselves those sorts of questions quite a lot. And I think I was lucky enough to write that book at a time when the right to die debate was very big in England, um, you know, the, the issue of assisted suicide. And so people were asking them themselves, themselves those questions naturally. Yeah, Jojo is referring to Me Before You, Viver Depois de Ti, which is the book that came out, came out also as a, as a movie, but I recommend the, the book. So as a reader, again, another book you mentioned and you chose, and it's also trans I'm, I'm taking them beneath my computer. Tomorrow from Tomorrow from Tomorrow. Tomorrow yes. and Tomorrow and Tomorrow from Gabrielle Zevin. We also have in Portuguese, Dia Manhã e Amanhã which was also a huge success. And you loved it also. Well, I didn't want to read this book. My daughter recommended it and she doesn't recommend much to me. So I take her view seriously. But I said, what's it about? She said, it's about computer gaming. And I went, no, that's <laughs> no, not thank you. Be my thing. And she said, I promise you, mom, this is the best thing I've read this year. And I read it and it's not about, it is about computer gaming, but what it's actually about is friendship, love, power dynamics in the workplace. Uh, yeah, just navigating the creative world. Um, you know, it's about ideas and, and how they survive. Uh, and it's just about real, uh, dynamics between three people whose lives become very entwined and It's like nothing I've read before. And it has a scene two thirds of the way through that made me cry for an hour. It wow. is such an extraordinary imaginative. I can't tell you about it, which is so frustrating, but. Yeah, I, I read it, it but I, maybe our listeners haven't. <laughs> okay, well, it, it, it takes a major event in somebody's life and puts it through a different prism. That's the only way I can say it. And it's so imaginative and heartbreaking and brilliant um i just remember sitting on my bed unable to move for an hour and i love getting an emotional response from books i love it if a book can make me laugh or cry and so even if it wasn't a genius idea and a very clever story i would have recommended it just for that one chapter because it's quite hard to make me cry in a book and it it destroyed me <laughs> Was it that part in the, we cannot say more, but was it that part at the office that happened at the office? Yes, at the okay. office. Yeah, we're yeah. together on that. <laughs> you know, the, the critics about this book, so tomorrow and, and tomorrow. it was so unexpected. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was. Same as life is, that's why you exactly you this, because it's the unexpected, literally. Yeah. So uh, the, the um, it has a lot of praises. One of the best books I've ever read, says John Green, One of the few I really liked a lot this year, James Patterson. And the book everyone loves, loved this book, Jojo Moyes. <laughs> oh, yeah. am I on the cover? No, I didn't you're, know you're on the, <laughs> oh, on the online critics. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so, yeah. De amanhã, hein? Amanhã. She's an American author, Gabrielle Zevin, and a screenwriter. She wrote several novels, including for young readers. And they all, uh, together, they all got the best list, the bestseller list or a nomination for an award, or even won it. So it's a great author. Now comes the time where I recommend you books. Okay. Readings. So you said you love to, to feel something and even cry. And yeah, you describe several of these books. And you remind me those times, a book I read. And I, I sometimes I know if a book, if I know beforehand, if a book is sad, I'm not willing to, you know, go yes. there. I don't. Yeah. But I love it when it makes me cry and I wasn't expecting it. So that happened a lot with Kristen Hanna. Have you read her? Oh, is it The Nightingale? The Nightingale. I have I heard cry. about this book I and I haven't read it yet, but you're, I think, the third person to recommend it to me. So I think I have to read it. Nightingale. I was, I have, well, with books I can manage, but in my real life, I have difficult, uh, I, it's difficult for me to cry, which is not good, but I'm trying to... <laughs> 
But when it comes to books, sometimes I, I managed to cry. And this book, I had to get out of bed. Everyone, the boys were asleep. And I went to the kitchen, you know, to, to yeah. find out. Oh, my goodness. And the text of the friend, like, have you have you finished it? We have to talk. And she hadn't. So I was like, I want to talk to somebody. 1 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> okay. That's a good recommendation. Yeah, by Kristen Hanna. And then I, I believe you know her, Marion Keys. Yes. So I the last two of her, I recommend. Of mine. She's your friend. Yeah. I'm, I'm a huge fan. And she's not even, she's not translated yet. And so I'm talking to publishers to try and bring her to Portugal, especially with the grown ups and the break. Oh, just, I've read every single one of her books. I think she's so clever and she writes about really difficult subjects, but with such humor and wit um, and lightness that you don't realize how much you're being schooled as, as it goes along. And there's a book she wrote called The Mystery of Mercy Clothes some years ago, which discusses depression. And I thought I knew what depression was, but this character experiences it, chemical depression, not, you know, not just go for a walk, but like proper full. Of... And I remember again, a bit like you sitting on my bed and weeping because she explained to me the psychology of depression so much more effectively than any medical text, any, you know, nonfiction I'd ever read. But she's funny. She's so funny yes. and wise as well. I, every one of her books I, I've read and I look forward to them because, you know, um, Rachel's Holiday, her first book, yeah. which has got this lovely title, Rachel's Holiday. <laughs> it's about life in a in a rehab center and it's about self-delusion and it's about the relationships we create with other people and with ourselves and it's so cleverly done so that you don't realize the depth of this woman's delusion until two-thirds of the way through the book and then you realize the title is telling you that this woman's <laughs> deluded she's acting like she's on a holiday she's yeah. she's there for drink and drugs but somehow again is it, you know in case any of your listeners are afraid of things that sound too heavy you will laugh and you will rejoice with these characters and you will recognize the family dynamics and I mean I'm amazed she's not big, big in Portugal because I feel like every family will understand Maria <laughs> yeah exactly well our time is running out so I want to okay, thank sorry. you so much and also the break, the break for Marion Keys is about long relationships, yeah. long marriages. It doesn't get written about much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Jojo, it was such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. And I'm looking forward to reading those books now. Oh, great. I'll DM you on your Instagram to remind you. Nice to thank meet you. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.